Buen día. Es un gusto darles la bienvenida a Good morning. esta sesión. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this session of the permanent seminar of Mirta Colón. In this occasion, we will be talking about Garinagu, the epic story of a people that defy disappearance. This conversation is going to be moderated by Mirta Colón, president of ONECA, and with the participation of Garifuna researcher Andoni Castillo. Throughout this conversation, we will explore the origins of the Garifuna people and the rich culture. From there, we will delve into how the background has given them strength for the struggles that they have faced over the centuries, from their resistance to forced displacement to the preservation of their identity through language, music, and spirituality. This webinar will offer an in-depth look at the resilience and strength of the Garifuna people. This event is a unique opportunity to learn about a people who, despite the challenges, have kept their identity and spirit of resistance alive. We would like to begin this session of the permanent seminar with a video in which members of the Garifuna community reflect on the importance of their tradition and celebrations that they have inherited from their ancestors and also the importance that they have for the care of their community. During the most complex years of uh, COVID-19 pandemic, practices such as wearing masks, staying informed, and getting vaccinated against diseases were key to the well-being and the health of the Garifuna communities, especially in their initiative to community and these indications in their mother tongue. We invite you to listen to the video now. The Garifuna community couldn't celebrate this. In irony, we commemorate us and to express our gratitude for all of the good things that we received during this time. We celebrate that we have life and we ask to our ancestors for intelligence to get through the challenges that are upcoming. We recognize that we wouldn't be able to survive the pandemic without the support of our own people. During COVID-19, we needed to take care of each other. I care about my community, so that's why I use masks. I get stay informed, I get vaccinated, and I try to my biggest effort. Together, we are stronger. Together we are community. Together we are health. Globe icon. In this effort, we recognize the legacy of um, Mir Tekolon, activist and social worker that is a hunter and, and Garifuna, president of the Central American Black Organization, ONECA, who has dedicated much of her life to the defense of the Caribbean immigrants, sex uh, education, and also the protection of the Garifuna population. Today, we have the privilege to have Mirta in this conversation. We also have with us Andoni Castillo Perez, researcher and Garifuna anthropologist from Honduras. He has a master's degree in economic and social research methodology from the National Autonomous University of Honduras. He has been a professor at the National University of Agriculture, UNA, in Catacamas, Honduras, and self published writer with books such as the historical novel of the Garinagu called Baragua, the Masters of the Sea which in Garifuna language means ocean. Another book is The Insurrectional Resistance of the Garifuna Revolution. Another book also is African Explorers in the Americas, among other publications. Thank you, Andoni Castillo, for being here with us today. And now I give the floor to Mirta Colón. Thank you very much, Helso. We want to start 
Thank you. Thanks to all of you and also to Alianza Americas for creating this space for us, this space to share. I believe that the fact of us being able to share our history it's a great opportunity and beautiful opportunity for us. It's very important. It's important for us because for us through sharing is that we are getting known better in the world. With Andoni Castillo, we met, I think, I think we met at the beginning of the 1900s in New York, where Andoni, he was starting to write. I think he wrote his first book in New York City. And after he decides to come back to Honduras, and since then, he hasn't, he hasn't stopped writing and sharing the story, the history, because our history, we don't have a complete history. We still don't have it yet, but I think we're still getting more information throughout the year it's for us to, to be able to leave this legacy to our children, to our grandchildren too. So in here, we have four questions for the discussion and I want to start asking and I want to start asking Andoni the first question which is about the Garifuna people Andoni what is the Garifuna people good morning good afternoon for some in the first place, uh, thank you, thank you very much for Alianza Americas for the invitation. And it's an honor for me to be here and to share this space with uh, Dr. Colon because we we met, we've known each other for a lot of years and we've always had contact throughout the years and always sharing also historical elements related to the Garifuna population. And answering your question, Mirtha, uh, in the last years, we've gotten to the conclusion that for us to be able to contextualize the Garifuna history and to be able to understand it in a way in a way that's more objective and explicative, we've identified that that there are several periods of the Garifuna history, the pre-Columbian period, the Colombian history, and also the contemporary uh, his, uh, period. In these three periods, we try to explain each experience based in each of these uh, periods. The pre-Columbian period uh, writes or the the presence of the indigenous people in the islands, especially in the San Vincent Island. And at the same time, we share and we are, we agree with the historians that have written about the immigration of this population from South America to the islands in the Caribbean that started in the Christian era in 12 hundreds years around that time and in this population of course they used to live in the they lived in the caribbean islands and they established in this island that we mentioned san vincent and what we were able to identify from the arawako population and after that we have a new thesis about the presence of the immigration, African immigration in the 1300s, uh, that they were also living in the San Vincent Island. And, and then we get to the colonial era in which the presence from the Europeans is stored in the islands, in the Caribbean islands. And of course, that starts in 16, in 1610 or 1620. And of course, we start, or that there's a new historical element 
in which we known as the resistance from the indigenous population that used to live in that territory before having European or Colombian presence. So that's the that's how we know that the indigenous people they got together and they fought against the colonization uh, uh, against the uh, slavery and of course uh, there's a discussion about the origin of the Garifuna people in the san vincent island some of the things that we've that we've tried to uh, the are the different theses that exist behind this presence of these uh, several populations in the island and how the Garifuna population originated in the San Vincent Island. And one of those is the explication, the most popular explication inside of the collective. And also that's been legitimized by different institutions, academic institutions, and also governments about that a ship bringing slaves, African slaves, uh, uh, got to the island in the years of 1635. And this ship, this ship was sunken and the survivors just mix with the rest of the population in the island. That's the most popular thesis or explication. However, there's new discoveries that define that the where the thesis it's uh, missing. It's saying that the Garifuna people used to live in this island before the slavery times. That's why the Garifuna people weren't able to be under slavery because they organized, they fought for their territory and to defend their lifestyle under the presence of the European colonization. And this is closer to the collective narrative that we have, that we have as a uh, as Garifuna population, because inside of or the Garifuna people, we identify as a, a as an indigenous people with a different particular and with a with a own religious own spirituality and we affirm and with a lot of determination with that we are not descendant of that population that was under the slavery in san vincent island or we believe that our people was always free in the island. However, it's important to clarify that our characteristic or physical characteristics today, without a doubt, inside of the island, there was a lot of symbiosis with the African element that got, that got to the island and we without a doubt there was a mixture of different races and there's a lot of uh, cultural elements and linguistics elements from the african ancestors however the tongue that we speak is a uh, tongue awaka and we of course, what got some elements from the African ancestors and also the incorporation of other tongues like French or Spanish, English too, that also exist in our language that came after we built their relations, uh, the relationships that the Garifuna had during that time. In the first place, they built relationships in St. Vincent Island with the English people and also with the French people. That's why we have some terms in English or French inside of our Garifuna language. And of course, in their trip to Roatan, Honduras, they also built relationships with the Hispanic population that there was. And that's how also some elements in Spanish were incorpor incorporated to the 
language, but the Garifuna tongue is a Awaraka. It's not a it's not a language that's a product of a mixture, just how some theses about the origin of the Garifuna language say, or how some linguistics uh, have said, we assure that we have roots, this tongue has roots, in the Amerindian languages and also the Warawaka language. The Griffina people fought constantly in the St. Vincent Island. There was a lot of fighting around 182 battles that the Griffina people had in St. Vincent Island when the European colonizers got to the island and they also had several treaties. The first treaty that the uh, Garifuna population had was with the French people and uh, well, the English people was in 1960. Six, 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 and the second one was in the 1760 year with uh, the independent movement in the U.S. And this last uh, treaty, the British, they recognized that the Garifuna population is a it's a population that was originated in the St. Vincent Island that they are the ones that had the territory. And however, that treaty is recognized as if, as a country, they call, used to call them the Caribbean country. And there were several negotiations between the Garifuna people and the Europeans. In the same way, they also built uh, alliances cooperation alliances in the island. And there were also negotiations between between them, uh, negotiations that include commercial alliances uh, among the French people, the English people, and the Garifuna people. Uh, and we know that the Garifuna, they always had their freedom because of the treaties, the alliances that they sign or agree with them. And after the last, the last battle was in the year of 1796, almost after a year of the death of their Garifuna leader, Joseph Chacuyer, which was a big negotiator, a person that was in front or leading the resistance process with his wife that we as the Garifuna people, we recognize and we give them honor which uh, her name is Barauda. There's not a lot of writing about Barauda. And we were able to identify that there's an area in St. Vincent that it's uh, honoring her name. We're also, we're still investigating to try to have some historical elements in the, about her contribution in the fight for the defense of the culture of our Garifuna people. And after the explosion of that last war, the British won the war in the island and they captured the Garifuna, about 5,000 Garifunas, and they took them to an island, Barison, Inside of the St. Vincent Island, they spent in that island around three months. And in that island, they died a lot of people, about 3,000 people. And the survivors went to, when were forced to, to get in a ship and to send them to the Roatan Island located in Honduras. And this historical event happened in the 
1779. And that's the history of resistance that we have and that we that we keep that legacy of our ancestor with us. And we keep we keep our language or tongue alive, which uh, is why the Garifuna language is my first tongue. And of course, a sector of our communities in, in Honduras, we learn Spanish as a second tongue in our schools. That's why it's a legacy that we keep from our ancestors, these, these fight and this resilience in which we live. It's part of the social dynamic that we are uh, rowing into. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, and Donnie, very much. Thank you for all of the information that you share with us. However, we would love to know a little bit more or to know, uh, to ask you what happened with uh, the people that fought in St. Vincent, what happened to them? We know that they didn't have a lot uh, the log of the people that got to Ruatan. Not everybody that was in St. Vincent got to Ruatan. What happened to that people then? And how we've uh, practiced the resilience or resistance, how we still practice the resilience or resistance in Central America after our ancestors go uh, leaving the St. Vincent. So, thank you. Thank you very much. There there's a very important element that before the capture of the 5,000 uh, Garifunas during the war in St. Vincent. However, in the year 1796, in which the war happened, they were captured around about, about 450 or 500 Garifunas with uh, French people and also with some other Caribbean people, they were moved to England to some jails in, in to England as war prisoners. Most of them were in Pochester is in Pushmar Harbor in England, very close to London. And they were moved there to the jail. Some of them died, of course. And not they were not just prisoners, male prisoners, but they also had some female prisoners and children prisoners. According to the Warwick University investigation, from uh, London, the jail was closed in the year 1803. However, the Garifuna people, they preferred to move to French, to France, and just few of them stayed in England. And we're still trying to do this investigation to track some of the possible Garifuna families that uh, stayed in England. We have information that most of them, most of them moved to France and they established in the La Rochelle uh, port and they got there in the year of 1803 in the framework of a treaty that the French and the British people sign for an exchange of uh, prisoners. Part of my work, my current work, is to track these Garifuna people that got to France during that time. And on the other side, uh, the, the people that stay in San Vincent Island were were persecuted had to isolate after the after losing the war and they were also oppressed to not talk their own language but to talk English and still the Garifuna communities are still living in the Saint Vincent 
island. Recently, last year, I was visiting there and I had the opportunity to meet with some of the leaders over there. They're organized and year after year, in March, we commemorate the day and, and the tribute to our leader, Joseph Chapulet, that was killed on on March 14 in 1795. So March 14, we commemorate the historical day, not just in St. Vincent, but also we do it in Belize, in Guatemala, in Nicaragua and Honduras, in which the Garifuna population is uh, it's present to the day. I don't know if I was able to answer your question, right? Well, yes. We are going to continue, and Donny, once that we got to Central America, once that we were brought or sent to Central America, we established, like you mentioned, throughout the North Coast in Central America. However, throughout the years, we also had some challenges, right? And we had big challenges that every country in Central America that we got, that we lived, we still have them to the date. How do you believe that we were able to manage almost more than a century in the region living in peace, living, well, we didn't have education, normal education, but we were able to live for more than 150 years in the region without having any conflict, right, in the region. How do you believe that we were able to accomplish that? What was the thing that we did during that time or during all that time for us to resist 150 years without having any problem with any neighbor? Well, after, after the Garifuna people got there in the 1700s, it, I think it was uh, April 12th in uh, 1797 to the Roatan Island. It wasn't like a vacation trip, right? It was a people that came to this place that were dying. Some of them were in chains because they were coming as war prisoners. And that's important to clarify and to bring up because sometimes when we commemorate that date or young people, they believe that was a routine or a routine travel or like a vacation trip. However, that was us getting moved from our land and the Griffin people, they were they were in the hands of the enemy and, and they got to the island and they try to look to try to find a way to establish in the island to start a new life there but also the history tells us that some of the ships before they got to the uh, to the island were taken by the Spaniards. So some Garifuna people, they were taken by the Spaniards and were moved to the Trujillo port. Trujillo is uh, land, of course, in Honduras. And there's also other parts of the history that to say that after getting there, the Garifuna people, they negotiated with the Spaniards and they decided to, to stay in the island. And the Spaniards gave them some part of the territory so they can contribute with them so they can move out the uh, the English people that wanted to occupy Trujillo, the Trujillo Bay. And of course, the English people after the Garifuna got to Roatan, they went back to Trujillo to move the Garifuna population to Roatan. And they were able to rescue one of the ships 
but the other ship were not able to to be rescued. So part of the Garifuna population stayed in Trujillo, in the Trujillo Bay. So simultaneously, these two ships got to Trujillo and to Rat 10. And after this, the Garifuna people, they got to, uh, they enter in a process of, for, uh, of survival because they're in a new place that is totally different. They came from the St. Vincent Island and that was their reality and the reality that they know. However, they found uh, possible solutions to be able to survive in Roatan and also in Trujillo. And forward uh, that time, the Garifuna, they started to interest in migrating to the land. That's how they got to La Ceiba City. And uh, there was a time in Central America where there was a, a lot of fight, a lot of battles for the uh, for the independence movement and also the the colonizers that wanted to take a lot of these uh, territory we're talking about the Spaniards and English colonizers uh, most of the Garifuna people that they didn't feel safe in this area they migrated to Guatemala in the beginning of 1803 1804 between those between those times uh 1803 and 1819 they migrated to Guatemala and Nicaragua and when this process takes uh the independence movement takes a uh, strength the Garifuna were part of this independence movement uh, in Central America and there's not they don't talk about this enough in Central America and in the universities and schools, but the, the Francisco Morazan, the big leader for the independence movement, he recruited Garifunas to be part of the of the old uh, army for the Republic, uh, the Federal Republic of Central America. And to the day, we only know Juan Francisco Bulnes that we denominate him, that he was uh, right next to Francisco Morazan and he was a uh, lieutenant. And uh, just recently, the Honduras legislation recognized him as a national hero that was right next to Francisco Morazan fighting. And, and, and there's a lot of historical elements and enough information about his life, about his biography and the the role that he played, which he was a Garifuna person during this uh, time of the independence movement in, in Central America. And and after after all of this, the Garifuna community, they incorporated into the national life. They fronted a lot of communities in the Atlantic coast uh, in Honduras from uh, Puerto Cortes, very close to the uh, border with Guatemala up to the La Mosquitia region. And, and moving geographically into into Nicaragua. That's why the, the, the Garifuna communities we are we are uh more mostly in the north coast in Honduras, which is a coast area very very rich. And we believe that is the area in Central America that is most wanted, not just in Honduras, but also in Guatemala. The Garifuna population in Guatemala, they're also located in a very rich area. In the same way in Nicaragua, they're located in Orinoco, very, very close of the Blutix Island, and, and also in Belize. We are also located in the coast and the Garifuna communities that they people the Garifuna people in Belize they fundated those those areas so those are the areas in Central America that are considered very very rich in the areas where we are located and that's why we live uh, big challenges day to day for the interest 
trans the, the transnational interest and in a way or governments they still contribute to this so that's why we believe that we generate this uh or we give some of this resistant move uh movement against the the threats to or human rights thank you thank you very much andoni we we continue right we because we believe that the problems of the land it's a big big problem in our communities not just in honduras but also in the region in every region that we live because in the same way it happens in belize in guatemala in nicaragua as well we have that problem with the land right so we mentioned Trujillo, one of the, the, the first uh, land community for the Garifinas here in Central America, Trujillo, that has a, a big problem, big problem for land. And then as being the first community uh, in the land for the Garifinas, it's supposed that, like you mentioned, at the beginning of the 1717, we got to Central America. We didn't get to Honduras. We get to Central America because in that time, it wasn't divided, the, the nation. It wasn't divided, the, the Central America Republic, but in the different countries that they are today. So the independence of Honduras is in 1821. So I don't know if before the independence there were, there were precedents, but at the moment, we have the problem, uh, the, the documents saying that they, they, they were signed by a president several years after we got to Honduras that we only, we only live there, but we are not we are not the owners of the area where we live. And we're talking this, that we would live there more than 200 years. What do you believe? What do you consider that happened or why? Why the, the Garifuna people are treated that way in terms that there are current laws that you cannot build a house in a empty land and if nobody gets there saying that is theirs you go and you put that land under your name and how it's possible that after 200 years living there and building our houses that land is still not ours so so about that we have enough evidence uh about the presence of the Garifuna people in Honduras. I think we share in during that moment uh, with the leaders that we that we that are being organized to defend to defend Punta Gorda because uh, they wanted to move Garifuna population from their own land because they had a document that was issued by England that after the independence of Honduras, they issued that letter to the new government of Honduras saying that they needed to respect the right of the Garifuna territory in the areas where they were living or they were located, especially related to Punta Gorda because the English people, they gave that territory to the Garifuna people for them to uh, establish there. So if there was a, so if that president in, in his moment, he wrote about it, I think that I can relate that to the process of to the uh, Eurocentrism in Latin America because there was a, a state uh, politics, not just in Central America, but also in South America. There was a state policy saying wanting to to, to uh, kill the descendants, uh, the African descendants, so they wouldn't mix with the rest of the population. That was the motive why the indigenous people were isolated and also the Afro-descendant population in 
Central America, including including them negate being uh, neglected or not being able to get studies or uh, being able to to have some of the human rights that every citizen has. And now today that we are living in a historical event in the fight for our lands, I don't, I don't doubt that these are some of the justifications the, that the government has. However, the Garifuna people, they got to Honduras and it's clear during the independence movement that was basically in the 1821, the Garifuna people, they were already living in that territory. So the first constitution of the Republic of Honduras or of this Republic, it's clear is the first justification of the old Central America Republic. It's uh, about this indigenous people and this Afro-descendant population that lived in Central America. So why, that's why the first uh, constitution of the Republic recognized the right of a Central America citizen the indigenous people and the Afro-descendant population that used to live in the Central America territory, I think is over any other, other pronunciation or any other law that in its moment were uh, attributed by any president of the Republic. So they try to just justify that they, that they only the Honduran people have rights to that territory. And finally, and only for us to give space to the audience to ask any question or give any comment, I hope that uh, we can close with this. Uh, finally, after all of this, what lessons do you think that we've learned or what any other lesson do you think that we can uh, share with the others? What are the lessons that we've had in terms of resistance, in, of resilience? But before we get there, I would like also to maybe talk a little bit about how we live for so many years preserving our language, preserving our culture in, in countries, in countries where there's a lot of discrimination and racism, how do we, how were we able for so many years to maintain that? I, I believe that I've always mentioned this, that maybe when they got there, they closed their doors and they didn't let nobody get to there because that was the only way that they found the opportunity to protect themselves and their children. And that's the thing that we used to practice, but we don't do it anymore. For example, we used to practice, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, we used to practice this part of how to create peace. I, I, I love that part of our culture. That is a part of how we created peace between us and how we created peace with the people around us, how we really strengthen spiritually for us to be able to fight with against all of those things that are outside of our community. And it's also the part of that we believe that every human being in this, in this life, it, it's sin right and that uh, when this human being dies he has to get to god to ask for forgiven forgiveness for the people that's still alive or the, the people that's still on the earth 
and how we keep happy that spirit is to honor that spirit so they can have the strength to get to God and to ask or intercede for us. I love that part of our, sorry, to be honest, uh, I love that part of our culture because that's the thing that kept us. Uh, first of all, kept us as a whole family, right? In which one of these practices, when we give the 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 food and we give these offers, we have a lot of the influence from the Catholic Church, right? But we also have the very in a spiritual part that it doesn't matter if you're in England and it doesn't matter if I'm in New York, we all have to get to that place to share with the family, to be part of uh, be part of that family, to know each other as a family. We all have to be, we all have to bring offerings. And that is a part for us to create peace among us, but also strengthen us spiritually to have a tolerance with others. And the other part is uh, that if tolerant we are tolerant to us but the other the, the other part that we have from this is also the critics that let's say that this has a been well for example we have we have the punta dance you know that the punta dance was an offer, used to be an offer, that when the somebody dies, then we also, we dance in honor to that spirit, honoring the spirit living us. And to me, I get the impression, and also correct me if I'm wrong, that that has an effect in our psyche because the punta is getting out of our soul and the punta is out of our and also our spirit is also out now so I, I don't think it's also the problem of the land that we've had it's not also is there's other things inside of our of our circle inside of our environment that used to maintain us united and used to kept us i think that we used we used to be very united i used to go and pick up uh shelves from the beach so uh so I can have some from when my mom got to the house. But that was so much happiness compared to nowadays that we have more and more abundance, but we are lacking now that spiritual part that we used to have back in the day. We've, we, we're lacking a, a lot of the things that we are not preserving anymore from our culture. So I would like to uh, give you the floor now so you can also share, uh, you can close close uh, this uh, discussion now. Yes, there's a very important element that I would love to share with uh, our people here with us. That is the the code, the ethic code that conforms the Griffin resistance, which is the spirituality. One of the forms of, of one of the ways for us to fight the enemy is the control over your spirituality and and the instrument or uh, the tool, the most important tool for the Garifuna people and their resistance is precisely that spirituality that with the Garifuna people, they never lost it and they're language of course the communication with their language the spirituality and your language goes hand to hand these are elements very important that strength and strengthen us as individuals and that's something that the Garifuna people never lost it in the St. Vincent Island and I want to also share something with you that's very important uh, two years ago I published a, a book called 
es una investigación dentro de which is an investigation inside of the French archives the donde me convencí que realmente and when I convinced really that the Garifuna people lived in the St. Vincent Island because in this data from the first uh, French that got to the St. Vincent Island in the year of 1805, they described the people that lived in the island basically they were the first Europeans that got to the St. Vincent Island in 1605, sorry. And they described the people that lived there, even, they even wrote uh, new words in their own language, that, in a language that they call Caribbean language. There were a lot of 150 and 200 words that I found in these archives in their Caribbean language. And when I see that language, when I read that language and I try to put it right next to the language that the Garifuna people talk today, currently, is the same language. And the description that they that they uh, give is a description about this uh, people, the population that they uh, have spiritual practices, uh, they have social economic uh, social economical practices, and it's the same practices that we are still doing uh, up today. And that's an evidence that we have a uh, very strong evidence that we have for us to be able to uh, bow other other theses written about Garifuna people and that are part of the this uh, colonized uh, colonized encounter and to know that the Garifuna people are not part of the colonizing movement. The Garifuna people they used to live in that island before, and that's why the Garifuna people weren't part of the slavery. That's why they organized as a as a population for them to resist this uh, Colombian time. And this treaty uh, during 1703 written, signed by the British and the British people, they say that they, the people are native to the island. They recognize that when they got there, that people were living in the island already. That's why this element, it's, it, we have to, to leave it to the audience that the Garifuna people are not part of the colonizing movement because everything that the colonizing movement took touch they destroyed it and and they brought about ten thousand african tongues to the americas during the slavery and none of these tongues are used in the americas today because there was somebody that had the control over the destiny of these people that were brought from Africa to the Americas. That's why the, the history of the, the Garifuna population is a resilience and resistance uh, history, a, a population that is original, originated in the island, and they have the objective of having their own territory and their own uh, culture. So the spirituality that you, that you talk about, it's, it's the spine of our population. And that's why the Garifuna people are still strong up to the day. And even of about our movement to Honduras, there was a time, I think it was in 1900s after the independence movement, the church got to the Garifuna population the Garifuna Aryans to try to, uh, maybe we can have five or six more minutes for the Q&A. So we can uh, we can answer the questions because we're uh, almost running out of time. So I don't know if we can if we can get some help from Hazel for the Q and I. 
Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Andoni, for all of the things that you share with us today about these uh, historical movement from the Garifuna population and for all of those very important comments about the spirituality and tradition from the Garifuna people. And we're going to have now some questions from the audience. We have now Angela Zambrano. And her is asking, we're going to take two or three questions and then we're going to wait for the answer from Andoni after. What is the role that the Garifuna population has? And also I want to uh, have another question. What was the, the role of the Garifuna movement, uh, women in the time? Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. The Garifuna women, they had a very important role. And I think um, me, Mrs. Mirtha, she can also say something. I think the image that we have today about the Garifuna resistance in San Vincent Island, there were a lot of women, but there's a one that we believe that uh, have more information about. And there's, even though there's not a lot of uh, reading and a history about the role of the women during that period. However, the things that we found up to the date is that there's a territory in the San Vincent Island that uh, is named in honor to the name of Barauta. Barauta, we, we say that she was the wife of our leader. She was one of the, the wives because they didn't have one. They used to have several. But she had a very important role with him. And she gave him very, very strength, a lot of strength to him. And she also played a very strong role in our uh, population. The, usually, the uh, Garifuna culture is a matriarchal culture because uh, the women, they take care of our children. And the, in our culture, the center of how we preserve our, our culture is its center in the women. I don't know if... It, yes. So... Doña Mirta, estamos perdiendo su audio, si no me equivoco, me, me corrigen, si estamos perdiendo su, su audio. I think we're not being able to listen to... Uh... Now it's better. I think we can hear you now. Uh, I was uh, saying to Andoni that there's a part in the history that he is forgetting that is a part in which uh, Barauda says to uh, his, her husband, if you cannot fight the English people, give me your uh, weapon and your pants and I'm going to do it myself. And that's uh, something that we've heard throughout the years. And for us, uh, it's uh, for groups in our communities or leader by women. And that's also a historical thing for us to be able to keep our families or communities. So inside of our communities, there's several organizations in our organization that are leader by women. Another question, Hazel, please. Now we have uh, questions related to to Yanira, uh, by Yanira, why is it important for the Garifuna people to to share your story with uh, the Andoni investigation? And another question is, in what way this information can change the president and also impact the future of the Garifuna people wherever a Garifuna person can be in the world? And also, I want to ask another question is, how the youth from the Garifuna people, they uh, are keeping their history. I think that when we get to, to the discussion about our history and how to, we, 
we have new questions, that means that a, a population is advancing. And in the first place, it's not us, the one writing the history. It was other people that wrote our history. And nobody can, can nobody's going to write um, marvelous things about your enemy, of course. So uh, the history that was uh, written during the colonization era about the Garifuna people and also the narrative is, of course, uh, saying a lot of colonial interests about the role that the Garifuna community uh, played in the moment. That's why with a group of uh, Garifuna academics, we've been questioning the history that we read because it's not congruent to the narrative uh, that we have in our communities. So what we read is, is something that is very far away from the reality. So that's something that it gave us the opportunity to us to keep investigating, to do some research, to rewrite the history, so we can have a narrative that it's congruent to the reality, the, the re historical reality of the Garifuna people. For example, when we found the treaty from 1763 among the uh, between the Garifuna population and the British people. It's a treaty that was signed in a, in an era, in a period in which the independence movements were uh, being born in Central America and especially also in the U.S. And we found some opinions uh, that the United States were were uh, trying to find information about how the Garifuna movement uh, were able to sign this treaty with the British. So for us in Central America, we didn't have access to this information. And we didn't know that in the year of uh, 1760, they signed this uh, treaty, right? So how is it, uh, is it possible that you brought people from Africa that are slaves and then when you get to the land, you sign treaties with them. It's it's something that's not congruent. And they signed those treaties because uh, they were the owners of the island. And that's why they signed the treaties, because they recognize you as the owner, as a native in the island. So that's why we're trying to rebuild that history based in the translation of the information and also based in the analysis of each one of the colonial narratives and how are they talking or how are they writing this history because they write it from the power over the people that they consider that they don't have rights to share their own story. And I think that this question is, is something that we're focused Focusing on uh, uh, during this time, and uh, a lot of debates have been generated, not just in our uh, Garifuna community, but also in, in, in academic institutions. Uh, that's why today, academic institutions, they are having, uh, they're trying to research more and to, and to have a different look into the Garifuna population. Yes, I, I also wanted to share something about that, about the terms, how we can change at the, today and how we can include the youth. And that's an effort that we are trying to do, but at the same time, it's a challenge. And the challenge is a big, because we remember that it, it, in the moment, in our own history, for example, a lot of, many of us, I was a victim of that, the, the term that we, try to say to our parents that uh, they didn't have to teach us uh, or tongue or Garifuna tongue in the in our house. So when you don't have that space or that opportunity to be you and to be true to your uh, customs, we had to be a different person. We had to talk Spanish and to forget our Garifuna tongue. The Garifuna language is not just a language. It's not just our tongue. The tongue has a lot of uh, spirituality, a lot of content when when somebody is crying from the Garifuna population you're going to cry with that person because or tongue or language has a lot of feeling to it so now the parents from our youth 
they they don't speak Garifuna. We have also some grandparents that they 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 don't talk Garifuna. And for example, my mom she she went to school and and in the school they told her that they she didn't have to teach me Garifuna. And nowadays we don't want to be Garifuna either because the Garifuna population, they dress differently and we don't want to dress that way. So uh, the youth don't want to be like that anymore. And it's 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 something that we are still fighting. It's a challenge that we're facing and how and we're trying to find a way to recover that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're closing now. Thank you for everybody that stay in this extra minutes. And we want to thank Andoni and Mirtha for their very uh, punctual uh, answers. The last questions that are related and how the how the Carinagu uh, self-identify and the question is if you should say Garifuna Afro-descendant or what is the term that you uh, tell them? And the other question that is related is that more to the uh, current challenges. So what challenges uh, the Garifuna is it's facing today that probably the Garifuna community that lives in the U.S. or the Garifuna community or population that lives in other parts of the world? What are the challenges that they face? El audio, Antonio. El audio. Tiene que abrir el audio. Oh, you're muted, okay. Antonio. Uh, uh, well, answering how we identify ourselves, we have just one identity as Garifuna population, which is we are Garifuna population or Garinagu. We say Gariganu when we talk about a group of people. And Garifuna, when we talk about uh, a singular person, so we are, we know that we are an indigenous population, and in that way, we also are not uh, defined by the UNESCO. How, how when they talk about the Garifuna music and dance, when they talk about it as a patrimony for the humanity. So we should be called as Garifuna or Garinago. We don't take any other identity. That's the identity that we have. And uh, 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 related to the, according to the other question, I don't remember the other question, sorry. The challenges, the challenges that the, the Garifuna community uh, is facing, uh, the Garifuna uh, community that lives in the U.S. or in other uh, countries. So there's an important element that the Garifuna culture is a culture uh, that's, uh, that we are explorers. That's how we also think of ourselves. And we, and this doesn't start from more movement to Central America, but also in the Caribbean islands, we, we we moved throughout the the, the area before the the colonizers uh, arrival to the area or even during it because they guy now they used to live in San uh, Lucia in Dominica also in Martinica Island and they used to have commercial exchange with the, these other islands and there's also data about uh, the, the Garifuna uh, moving down to South America because the the these are uh, some of the Caribbean islands are close to the to South America in which they also built alliances with uh, the uh, the Garifuna groups and that's something that we also experimented in Central America in our arrival uh, to the island of Roatan and Honduras. That's why it was easy for the Garifuna people to 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 move to to Belize, to Buga, to Nicaragua in the beginning of the eighteen hundred years. So so. And the other element that's important, I'm, I'm in here, I'm going to answer your question, is that we're also a immigration to the U.S. from the year of uh, 
1940, uh, that's when the uh, immigration process also starts, that nowadays also it's, it exists a lot of, uh, a big uh, amount of people living in the U.S. There's a there's more Garigonos living uh, nowadays in uh, the United States than in Central America. And that uh, explorative ex uh, or that explorer's uh, sense that we have allow us to share with a lot of other communities. Even in Honduras, they contributed a lot to organize the other indigenous uh, people whenever the confederation of the indigenous uh, movements uh, started, they help. And we have that uh, ability to uh, coexist with other people, even when the Catholic uh, church installed in our communities, the Garifuna population, we receive them, but we also have an ethic code that allow them to keep practicing their own culture and to not uh, give that space to be culturized to or completely culturized uh, with another uh, culture. So we continue uh, using your tongue. It, it, we still build relations in the case of uh, Central America. And we, nowadays we go to school, to university, we graduate from schools, but we also keep our culture, right? We, we, of course, there's an impact in this. There's an impact of, of the, uh, the, that we have as a culturization, but we have an, a code, as I explained, that allows us to conserve our culture, to keep our language. And that element has taken us to share or to transmit our language or, or culture from generation in generation. And we found that space. We found that uh, a way to connect, but it's also a big challenge for us. In the case of the new, the, the youth, the children, nowadays because the, the, the same uh, programs of uh, the that, that are teaching or language they need uh, to be strengthened so we can uh, defy these other elements. I just want a small moment, uh, Hazel, please, to share something. It's just to add a little bit about the self-identification. As Andoni was saying, the Garifuna population is identified as Garifuna wherever we go. However, we've been able to participate in processes, uh, universal process about human rights, and in those spaces, we have been identified. We have to include in the process uh, to uh, as Afro descendant. So it's Afro descendant is a political space in which we have to be included with other people. And there's also the Afro Latino uh, uh, reference. It's also a political reference, Afro descendant, Afro Latino. But the Garifuna is identified as Garifuna. But we also participate in this uh, fight. For example, we were part of the the, we participate in Durba in the Worldwide Conference for the Discrimination and Racism. We also participate in Geneva, in which all of the people that is Black, they call Afro descendant, and we were there and we were part of that fight. But those are polit uh, politic spaces that when we have to be called that way or we use that word, we 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 take it, of course. And as a challenge, uh, for us in the United States is the challenge that every immigrant has in the United States. And maybe a little bit more that the, the immigrants that some other immigrants have because, because of the fact that we ourselves, we sometimes we isolate ourselves 
Sometimes we isolate from the fight. You have to realize that we still have that after 200 years, we still, we are still afraid to be excluded, to be isolated, to be uh, moved from our lands. So a lot of us, we have, we are fearful of all of this. So we are only incorporated in some areas in which we feel safe. So it's a very big challenge, a big fight in the community and also for our or community to keep growing in the following years. Thank you. Thank you, Pepe. Thank you for Alianza America to allow us to talk in this space. And of course, uh, uh, I know I'm very uh, convinced that Antonio is always going to be available for us in any moment if we need to, if we need to if we need to come back here to, to talk about this because we talk about a little bit more about the history to give a little bit of context about who the Caribbean population is. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex, Bruce, Hazel. Thank you for everybody here from uh, Alianza America. Thank you, Andoni. I know you took your time to be here with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Angela Zambrano. You're always going to be in my heart. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to the two of you, to Mirza, to Andoni for this space. Thank you for everyone, for all of the people that are, is here. Uh, we want to also say we're sorry for not being able to cover all of the questions and all of the comments that you have. We want to be here with you again for the next seminar with uh, Mirza Colon. So we're going to leave the door open for Mirza to talk about the realities of the uh, current context of the very few now population. So thank you. Thank you very much to every one of you. And we are going to expect you in the next Gracias. seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Andoni. Adios. Adios, Mirta. Adios, adios, adios. Adios, un abrazo. Igual, igual, igual. Igual, igual. Me acuerdo cuando estuve en Rota. Saludos, saludos. Contigo. Adiós, Anthony. Comunidad. Hasta luego, hasta luego. Un placer. Hasta luego. Gracias, apoyo de las personas de la PRICA.